I'm Gerald Nicholson, and I joined the Marine Corps in 1966, and I was in Marine Corps for about a year. I started flight school after a lot of initial training. I completed flight training in 1968, and then went to a Marine Corps squadron where I learned to fly a transport helicopter carries about 20, 25 Marines. Awesome. I did that uh, for six years on active duty, and then I was in the reserves flying a smaller helicopter for another four or five years. And I was in the reserves then for 16. Served a total of 22 years in the Marine Corps. I went to Vietnam in 1969, and a lot of flying in Vietnam is fairly routine. We take uh, food, supplies, mail out to the troops out in the field, and that's what we did. There were some days that we went day after day after day, and other days it was kind of relaxing and take it easy. Had, uh, there were days that I didn't fly at all. Those were rare. Um, most days I would fly two or three hours, there were some days that I flew the maximum of eight. And there, you also alternate um, the kind of flying you do. There are flights that are just kind of routine, bus routes, transportation. Uh, there are flights where you fly the general around or some uh, visiting um, dignitaries. Uh, we fly USO personnel um, who are giving a show. You'll fly them from their airport out to where they're giving the show. Those are easy days. Um, but there are other days where it gets a little more exciting. There was uh, one day that uh, a Vietnamese village was being attacked by a troop, some North Vietnamese troops. So we were taking Marines in to a landing zone near that village to help defend the village. The uh, North Vietnamese troops who were there obviously didn't want us to be there. So we were flying into a landing zone. There were four helicopters, each with about 25 Marines on board. You try to land in the landing zone, all four helicopters at the same time, so all those Marines can get out at the same time because they are only, they have a mission. They know where they're going and what they're doing, but they have to get together. And it's also better if they're all there at the same time because they're also protecting us while we're sitting on the ground because we're fairly defenseless. Once we landed in the landing zone, the enemy started using mortars, which are small explosive rockets that they launched into the landing zone. Fortunately, they hadn't been aiming before that, so they were just kind of scattered shot into the landing zone. But there's always a spotter that the, that the people use when they're using those kind of uh, mortars to see where they're landing and they can adjust the mortar tube so that it goes different places. So what you have to watch for is if they're walking the mortars towards you, you know that you've got little time and you gotta get going. Well, fortunately for us, they kept scatter shotting the mortars. So we were fairly comfortable sitting there and just as we, one of the things you do as a helicopter pilot, as soon as the troops you are carrying are off the helicopter, you wanna get out of there. But there's four of you, so you wanna wait for the other others to be ready too. And the flight leader will say, ready to go. And as you empty your helicopter, you tell him, I'm clear. So that he knows that all when all four helicopters are done, then he'll lift off and we follow him. Well, the first, the flight leader was getting ready to go and his the first two were clear, ours was clear. And just as we were getting ready to launch, the fourth helicopter, which was on my left, got hit by a mortar round right in the middle, split the helicopter in half and set it on fire. I couldn't see it, but my co-pilot could and the crew chief, of course, is watching. And so we're counting at that point, we knew that all the Marines were off the helicopter, but we didn't know what happened to the crew. And one of the obligations you have as pilot, co-pilot, and the helicopter crew is to take care of the other crewmen that are with you on the other helicopters. So we were waiting to see who came off that burning hulk of a helicopter. Hopefully, we we're gonna see four flight helmets, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the two crewmen. 
seemed like a very long time, but the crew chief then told us he did see four men running towards our helicopter. And of course, they were going to run towards the closest helicopter, which was us. I keyed the mic and told the other two, the other two helicopters to get out, that we were going to wait for to pick up the crewmen. It took them, it seemed like about a year and a half to run that uh, 50 yards between their burning helicopter and ours because the other mortars are still hitting and we could get unlucky just like they were, but you gotta sit there. The other thing you, you look for is that the bad guys are shooting at you, of course, and the skin of the helicopter is around you. And one of the things you notice is all of a sudden where there was helicopter skin, now you can see sky. So you know those bullets are coming through, but you can't hear them. The noise of the helicopter and the radios on your helmet um, drown out all the other noise. The other two helicopters took off. The four crewmen finally got to our helicopter and we raised the ramp and we were able to take off. That was the more one of the more exciting adventures that we experienced. All right, we're gonna go flying. We need to have a flight suit. And that's here in the closet with everything else. You know, the thing, nice thing about flight suits is, of course, we pilots call them zoom bags because it's basically just a big bag. You climb into it and it's on you. Has little pockets for pens and pencils, all sorts of little odds and ends on your sleeve. And there's pockets here, and there's pockets down here. And you wonder what you carry in those pockets. Some of that stuff is in here. This is your flight bag. Your flight bag carry emergency procedures guide, which you're probably not going to have time to read, but you have to carry it anyway. And you carry one of those pockets in the bottom of the flight suit. This is a knee board. When you're sitting down flying, this rests on your knee. So you got a place to write. There's a pencil. And if you don't have one there, you've got one in your pocket. And then, of course, you've got the helmet. You have flight gloves. These are fire resistant. The helmet plugs into the radios on the helicopter. And every aircraft has the same kind of little plug that plugs in so that you can hear all of your radios. You have a lot of earplugs. You have sound protection in the helmet itself so that it keeps all the noise out or as much of it as is possible to keep out and you've got the radio so that you can actually hear you can talk to the other crewmen you can talk to the whole world depending on which radio you're using well i'm sure you're all familiar with uh hearing all the stories about vietnam vets and how it was when we came home and for me it wasn't any different than i don't than it was for any other guys um, your family, of course, is always glad to see you, and the people that you, that you love and care about are there, but the, there was no warm welcome from anybody else. Um, because long hair was much the, very much the fashion, uh, it was easy to tell the guys who were in the military because we all had short hair. And there were people literally that would not even speak to us. Um, my experience wasn't a whole lot different than anybody else's. I never had any real direct confrontations uh, one time, but it wasn't serious. Most of the people just, um, at best, ignored me. Um, I can't say that anybody made me feel welcome home. How was things? Uh, what can we do for you? Can we help you? In any fashion, there, there was never any of that. Uh, there was, at best, a reluctant tolerance that I sensed from other people. The adjustment is, I'm not sure it's something any of us are consciously aware of. I didn't feel like I was that different. It was nice to be home. Home felt different. Uh, I still react to loud noises and I don't like to be surprised. Um, I can't say that I was had PTSD as bad as some other guys have had it, but I think it's something we've all experienced. Uh, my wife has informed me that I'm hyper vigilant. I just feel like I pay attention to my surroundings and what's going on. Um, but I've been told that that's hyper vigilance.
to me, it just seems you should always be aware of where you are and what's going on. I think that I've learned a lot in the Marine Corps. One was tolerating people that uh, weren't all that friendly. I learned self-discipline and structure. I learned that I could do things that I didn't know I could do. And I also learned that I could do pretty much whatever I set my mind to do or what somebody else told me I needed to set my mind to do. Thank you.